On September 28, 2019, retired Brigadier General Charles M. Duke was inducted into the National Aviation Hall of Fame. General Duke served as the Lunar Module Pilot on Apollo 16 in 1972 and also as the Capcom on Apollo 11. He is the youngest of the 12 men who walked on the moon. General Duke graduated from the Naval Academy in 1957 and commissioned into the United States Air Force. It was with the Air Force that he flew the F-86 Sabre, F-102 Delta Dagger, and later as a test pilot, the F-101 Voodoo and the F-104 Starfighter. Today, General Duke travels the world sharing his experiences and paying it forward to inspire the next generation of innovators and explorers. Ambassador Crystal Horton and I were honored to attend his induction and to have the opportunity to ask him a few questions. Ladies and gentlemen, General Charlie Duke. General Duke, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, being inducted into Aviation National Hall of Fame is a true honor, and uh, me and Crystal here would like to hear what that honor means to you. Uh, it's basically the highlight of my career. I never would have expected as a young boy that uh, my career would take me to this point, so I'm humbled. General Duke, we have a lot of aviation professionals, future pilots, future military officers watching, and um, I think they would all like to hear what advice, wisdom, and guidance you could give them as they pursue their dreams. Well, I think uh, it's important to keep your, I call it your antennas up. Uh, you might be thinking your career should go this way, but you have some nudges uh, that maybe you ought to go this way. And you ought to listen to that and think about that before you make those decisions. Uh, for instance, I was in Germany in 1962 and my time was up. Air Force wanted me to go back to MIT. Uh, but I could have stayed in Germany for another year, extended for one more year. If I had decided to stay in Germany, I never would have made it to the moon. Really? So that was an important decision to me to go to MIT because when I got to MIT, that's where I got the background, the education, and the encouragement and enthusiasm to volunteer for the space program. So. Uh, uh, just stay uh, attuned and uh, be open to uh, little changes in your career as you go through your education. How did you get interested in flying in the first place? Like when was there the point that you said, this is something I want to do with my life? Well, I knew when I was in the uh, 10th grade that I wanted to serve my country and uh, go to one of the academies, uh, military academies. And I chose the Naval Academy because my father had been in the Navy during World War II. Okay. And so they were my heroes. And when I got to the Naval Academy, I didn't even realize you could be an aviator, a pilot. But I had a choice of Naval Aviation. And back then at the Naval Academy, since it was not an Air Force Academy, I could volunteer uh, to go uh, into the Air Force. And so I got some uh, rides uh, in an airplane and I was hooked on aviation from that moment on. And I knew I wanted to be a pilot. That's when you caught the bug. Yeah, that's when I got the bug, yeah. And it was an old uh, pre-World War II open cockpit seaplane, double wing, mm -hmm. fabric covered, you know, the Red Baron stuff. And uh, so I volunteered uh, for the Air Force. I figured that was the best uh, avenue for me. And I mean obviously from there you went on to, to fly numerous fighter airplanes and become a test pilot and spend many years in the Air Force. Yeah. So over that time what was your favorite airplane to fly? Well uh, I'd say uh, it depended on the mission. In Germany I was in a fighter interceptor squadron uh, and there the F-102 was uh, my favorite. I get to Edwards Air Force Base and I get to fly the F-104, the F-106, the F-101, the T-38, uh, those kind of airplanes. And they all had their unique challenges and excitement. But the best for me was the F-104 because we flew such dramatic missions, zoom maneuvers to 100,000 feet. And I would imagine the F-104 was probably the most exciting airplane I flew in uh, my whole career. Can you tell us what your Apollo training experience was like on the Vomit Comet? Nobody really liked the Vomit Comet because 
You know, somebody was getting sick all the time on, in, back in the back end of this thing. Right. Because you're going up, you got zero G, two and a half Gs, <laughs> zero G, you know. And so your stomach's going up and down. And at zero gravity, you don't weigh anything. But on the pullout, you, it, in your spacesuit, I, you weigh 362 pounds <laughs> times two and a half Gs. So that's 900 pounds. And so you can't, your legs won't support that. So they slam you onto the floor and then they haul you back up and then you slam you onto the floor. So it was really a, an interesting experience. And uh, I could last, like I said, 57 parabolas and that was it. I'm ready to go home. So uh, General Duke, would you tell us just a crazy flying story from your Air Force flying days? Over in Germany, F-86, had a primary a main fuel control system for the engine and also a secondary control system which was manual and if you move the throttle too fast and manual flooded the engine and the temperature went up and so you had to you, you never knew whether it was going to continue to work so uh, I had a problem with my main fuel control on one flight and then, uh, the idea was to make an emergency landing so I called in and I had this problem and uh, I'm uh, setting up for my uh, emergency landing. We started, I don't know, in a, let's say 6,000 feet altitude. And you did a big 360 degree turn and then you landed. So I'm up there and I call uh, high key, we call it, and gear down and I, they said, Roger, continue. Uh, you have priority, but we don't see you. And I looked up and I realized, I'm not at Ramstein, I'm at another base. <laughs> and it was uh, about five miles away, but with the same direction runway. So I felt like an idiot. So I, uh, I should have continued to land, but I didn't, I turned away. And about a mile to the south, there was a village at the bottom of this hill. And so I, I roll out and I'm going and I level off and I look up and there's a church steeple right in front of me. So I'm like, 100 feet off the ground at this point trying to get this engine to work. I don't, miraculously, I picked up a wing and it went over the church steeple. And about this time it started flying again and I had control and I went back and sheepishly told everybody what had happened. And so I was the butt of the jokes in the officer's club that night. What do you feel or think about when you look up at the moon today? Uh, when I look at the moon, I have a couple of emotions. Uh, one is a sense of satisfaction that Apollo was so successful and I got an opportunity to participate and it's very challenging and, uh, but very rewarding mission. And there's a sense of accomplishment. You can sort of see your general area where you landed and uh, it brings back the memories of being on the moon and the second one is, it's still uh, an object that's uh, very beautiful in the sky. My wife and I love to look at the moon. We love to, uh, you know, it's, it's still a romantic object to us as a couple. And so those emotions, and I have the emotions of a sense of satisfaction of participating in that uh, wonderful experience. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So General Duke, tell us about the time on the moon where you were the only vehicle on the 14 million square mile surface and couldn't find a satisfactory place to park. We were the second flight with a rover. Uh, it was a great car, electric car, had four wheel drive. It had a steering handle in the middle between the seats. But John Young, my commander, was the driver and I was the navigator. We'd drive around and we had objectives that we had to get to. Uh, Plum Crater, for instance, uh, up on the side of Stone Mountain. And, and so we navigated to these spots and uh, up on the side of Stone Mountain, it was a steep slope. And so we had to do a, a, a big U-turn to find a place to park. And we were, uh, I mean, it was really steep going down hill and you felt like you're gonna fall out of this thing. And uh, so we found a little bench uh, that was level and John tried to park on that. That was uh, a satisfactory spot. A couple other times we found spots that uh, they were satisfactory to park, but we couldn't do it, couldn't turn it around. You know, there was a crater in front of us and we didn't want to back up because we had no rear view mirror. So what we would do is John got on his side and I got on my side and we just picked it up and turned it around. 
And uh, so Nat's pointed in the right direction. And that was fun. You had a big sense of strength up on the moon <laughs> to be able to pick up your car. Couldn't do that on the Earth, could no, you? Uh, <laughs> what is a vital lesson that you learned in your life that you hope is passed down to your children and grandchildren? Well, I think there are several lessons. Uh, one is uh, stay focused uh, on your career. I think you can question your decisions about what you should do uh, as you gain experience and don't question your decisions so much. Uh, just continue to march that trail that you're on, but be, be open. As I said earlier, you tend to be open to a different slight changes in your career. And I think it's very important that you uh, keep balanced in your life and not just work, uh, but uh, you have family, so you need to balance your family and your career, your time with all of that. and. Uh, your time to yourself, and a time with God. I think it's very important to have a, 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 a spiritual relationship. That developed late in my life, uh, but I think that was probably the most important decision I made. I have this peace and purpose, and I know I'm on the right direction because I believe uh, God is directing my, my steps. So one of our partners, Aviation Daily, uh, submitted this question from one of their subscribers. Um, he's an experienced professional jet pilot, and while cruising at, fr at flight level, he recently had an unidentified object pass by um, at what appeared to be a 15,000 mile per hour closing speed, and it was a wingless disc shape. Um, his co-pilot also saw it, and he wanted to get your opinion on unidentified objects like that. Uh, I've never seen a uh, UFO. Uh, I don't know any astronauts that have. Apparently, uh, they're becoming more and more frequent, these sightings, whatever they are. Uh, I have no problem with uh, extraterrestrial objects or uh, extraterrestrial life. If it's out there, uh, it's out there. We don't know. Uh, there's some evidence there is, there's some evidence there's not, but there are some bits, some credible uh, uh, sightings. And, and I, you know, that, well, if there is, there is. If there isn't, there isn't, is my, my take. And uh, it'd be interesting uh, if these UFOs would come up and start flying formation with somebody and uh, let us look in the cockpit and let them look in our cockpit <laughs> and see, see what happens. Awesome. Well, yeah. sir, thank you so much Thank for you your very time. much, Chris. Really I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Crystal, yeah. nice to meet you. Thanks. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you so much. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. It was a true honor to spend some time with American hero Charlie Duke and be inspired by his stories and wisdom. If this video earned your subscription, please subscribe below to see more awesome space-related content from the team here at Back to Space. Until next time, this is Back to Space Ambassador Chris Franklin. Over and out.